It's hard to call a Fallout game that was almost universally loved and acclaimed underrated, especially these days, but look back at the kinds of scores Fallout New Vegas was getting in 2010. It was the lowest rated mainline entry in the series. Only Fallout Tactics got worse scores on average, and a lot of people considered it a disappointment after Fallout 3. Now, many of us think that Fallout New Vegas is maybe the best game in the series, but to many reviewers back Back at the time, it was considered a subpar, bug-filled expansion pack and little else. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, let's talk about why Fallout New Vegas was so underrated. Now, I'm not exaggerating when I say these various reviewers looked at this game as subpar. Some of the reviews at the time were just scathing, like this one for example. If there's one thing that pisses me off without exception, slap shamelessly onto a distinctly happy half-arse product. And that review was far from an aberration. So it's not just a game that's figuratively underrated, it's also literally underrated. We're obviously not saying this is a perfect game, it was seriously buggy back when it first came out, but even then, the rest of the game was so good it really didn't matter that much, at least to us. So let's start off with some history. The Fallout series didn't actually start at Bethesda, but rather a small outfit called Black Isle Studios. Though they were only around for a few years, their original run lasted only from 1996 to 2003, they left a pretty huge mark on the gaming industry. The original Fallout was their first game in 1997, and they followed that with a sequel in 1998, both of which earned critical praise for their setting and storytelling. To call these games groundbreaking would be a huge understatement. Uh, like, they didn't exactly invent the open world RPG, but they took the RPG format and used it to tell a unique story set in a post-apocalyptic America that was part Mad Max, part 1950s pastiche, and while they're pretty archaic to play these days, those original Fallout games still hold up for their writing and world building, along with some pitch black humor that made the game almost feel like a parody at times. Yeah, it was all originally supposed to be based off of the game Wasteland, but the developers managed to make the setting their own. When Black Isle's parent studio, Interplay, folded in 2003, Black Isle's plans for a third Fallout game, then known as Van Buren, crumbled, and for all we knew, the franchise was dead. That is, until Bethesda's surprise announcement of Fallout 3 in 2007. This is kind of a tangent, but man, it was a hype trailer. Being a fan of the original games, I basically couldn't believe that Bethesda of all studios was reviving this relatively niche RPG series and giving it a AAA coat of paint like it was surreal to see. And make no mistake, Fallout 3 was massive when it came out. It got rave reviews and universal praise. In hindsight, it's easy to call a lot of the positivity around Fallout 3 as even a little overblown, especially in comparison to New Vegas's frostier reception. But it really was a great game in a lot of ways, even if it was missing some of the original spark that the first Fallout games had. It was all around just a little safer and a little more bland than those original games, and I'm still not completely over how they turned the Brotherhood of Steel into a bunch of generic white hat good guys, but that's kind of more of a my taste and a me problem. So regardless of certain hardcore fan complaints, Bethesda knew they had a hit on their hands, so they quickly commissioned a sequel to be developed by the studio formed by the remnants of Black Isle Studios, Obsidian. Now, Bethesda wanted another game out, and fast. The development cycle for this game was very brief. It was only about 18 months in total. Now, back in the 1990s, that wouldn't be outside expectations for a sequel, but in the late 2000s, that's absolutely nuts. Keep in mind, Fallout 3 was in development for almost four years before it came out, and although apparently the principal development occurred between 2006 and 8, after they'd finished work on Oblivion, either way, it just goes to show that New Vegas had a pretty quick turnaround, and that can at least partially explain some of its issues. The game was released October 19th, 2010, and as we've covered earlier, it came out to mixed reviews. Many publications praised it for its immersive story, while others trashed it for its bugs. Like we said, it is a game with some problems, but what it does well, it does really well. So if you don't know, here's what Fallout New Vegas actually is. It is an open world role playing game exactly like Fallout 3, but with a much heavier emphasis on the role playing part. That's really what makes the game stand out, both from 
the other Bethesda era Fallout games, and really from most other RPGs in general, few games give you the level of choice that this game does. It starts with by far the simplest and most mundane premise of any Fallout game before it. It's a short cutscene where your unnamed character, a courier, is robbed of his cargo and shot. That's the entire premise of the game. Your starting goal is a simple one, it's just revenge. After a perfunctory visit with a doctor who patches you up, from your seemingly fatal gunshot, you choose your appearance and your stats. Skill system is basically identical to the one from Fallout 3, and while this whole opening sequence isn't really that impressive compared to the opening of Fallout 3, which literally starts with your birth and fast forwards through your life in one of the vaults, it does have a big advantage over Fallout 3's. It's way shorter and lets you get to the meat of the game a lot quicker. The dirty secret about Fallout New Vegas is that the main story is the thing the game seems to be least interested in. The mystery of who shot you and what they wanted with the mail containing a chip you were carrying is important for sure, but it's mostly there as a way to get your character involved with the major players in the Mojave Wasteland. Of course, you eventually get to the titular New Vegas, a little slice of pre-apocalypse life that's somehow still operational, and that's where the real story begins. So, the game starts in a very unassuming way. You begin with almost nothing. You're stranded in a little backwater town, you have to slowly build yourself back up again as you follow the trail of the guy who tried to kill you. It's a game that doesn't seem interested in wowing you with big moments at the start, but instead immersing you in its unique world. The wasteland of Fallout New Vegas is a very different place compared to the capital wasteland of Fallout 3. Instead of being a mostly lawless place filled with monsters and raiders with only a few holdouts of humanity still around, the Mojave is a much livelier place. The amount of NPCs you can talk to dwarfs that of Fallout 3. There are more towns, settlements, and just generally more people. It feels more like a real living place rather than the dead monster filled ruin that is Fallout 3. More people means more history to discover, more quests to undertake, which just makes it a more interesting place in general to spend time in. One of our favorite things about New Vegas is the faction system. Everything you do affects your standing with the various factions in the Mojave Wasteland. While killing the enemies of a faction makes that faction like you more. It can be a little awkward in practice, but it makes the world feel so much more fluid and real. In general, the game has a more complex view of morality than Fallout 3's world of straight up good guys and bad guys, um, it's a world where everyone has an angle and not everything is quite what it seems. The political situation alone is one of the most interesting things about the game. There's three main factions and all three want control of the Mojave Wasteland. There's the New California Republic, a representative democracy that's currently trying to expand and wants to annex New Vegas. Their basic goal is to return to the America of the past with all of the positives and negatives that entails. And they also have a fascinating history all their own. Another faction is Robert House, the founder and CEO of Robco Industries from before the nuclear war and is the current leader of the New Vegas Strip. He's more of an enlightened dictator type who'd prefer that New Vegas remains independent and under his control. He's disillusioned about democratic society because of the war and doesn't respect or trust the New California Republic or the tribes of the East. The third faction is maybe the most interesting. That would be Kaisar's Legion, spelled Caesar but pronounced Kaisar by Legion members, a brutal conglomeration of tribes, gangs, and thugs who see classical Rome as the proper model for society rather than democracy. They rule their own territory with ruthless efficiency, uh, they enslave people, they crucify them, and they kill entire towns of people to instill terror against anyone they're trying to conquer. Unlike the NCR or Mr. House, they mostly ignore old world technology and see anyone who relies on it as weak. Seriously, these guys are something else and there are a few villain groups in video games who come off quite as despicable as they do. There's pretty much no atrocity they're above doing and that makes them really hateable and they are so smug. At the same time, they make sense. They're understandable and in some ways fairly realistic. They make a certain twisted kind of sense. That's what makes the world of Fallout New Vegas so interesting. It feels like a reflection of reality in a lot of ways. Instead of telling you these are the bad guys and these are the good guys, they present you with different ideas and let you come to your own conclusions. Because at the end of the day, it's up to you to decide what actually happens to the Mojave Wasteland. You can decide to side with any of the three main factions, and you cannot. You can go your own way. So that means there's four main routes you can pursue, and while they all climax at the Hoover Dam, what you actually do up to that point can be wildly different. Even now, very few games have this layer of player choice going on, uh, like almost everything you do has some effect regarding what ending you get, and there are
there are so many variations that it's kind of mind-boggling. Your choices obviously affect the fate of the three main factions, but there's a lot more to it. What you do in towns, certain quests, how you choose to resolve certain companion stories, it, it all has a possible impact on your ending. Another thing that's a big step up over Fallout 3 are the companions. They added a much needed companion wheel that allows you to more easily and quickly give orders and swap equipment with your companions, which makes them all around a lot more useful. Of course, making it so they can't just randomly die also makes them more helpful. So while companions are much more effective as actual helpers in the game, what makes them so great is that they actually have unique personalities. No other Bethesda game has a roster of companions as good or as memorable as this one. Uh, almost every character is just fantastic. The first most encounter is probably Craig Boone, a former NCR sniper with a big chip on his shoulder. Uh, he's an incredibly powerful ally that can trivialize certain enemy encounters, so he's just good to have around just for that. But really, they're all great. There's Veronica, a Brotherhood of Steel scribe, who shows a very different depiction to that faction compared to the depiction in Fallout 3. There's also Arcade, a dude with a connection to the Enclave, the main bad guys from Fallout 2 and 3. There's Lily, the Nightkin super mutant, the former member of the Master's army from Fallout 1. Like, all these characters are interesting in their own right. There's more we haven't mentioned, but you get the idea. They're seriously all great. Fallout 4 has some great companions, to be sure, but I just don't think any other game in the series beats New Vegas for the quantity and quality of its companions. We've been focusing on the story so far, but there were also a lot of smart mechanical improvements going on in New Vegas. They're not quite as obvious as all the story stuff, but Obsidian really did make a few changes that made New Vegas an all-around more fun game to play than Fallout 3. Another major improvement to combat comes with the damage threshold system, which basically controls how much damage you or an enemy will take depending on your armor values. Originally in Fallout 3, tougher enemies simply had a certain damage resistance, which could turn battles into a tedious slog as you waste your time trying to slowly chip away at an enemy's massive health bars, while in New Vegas, there are ways to bypass an enemy's armor and do a lot of damage to them regardless of their level. It's a complicated system to explain, but in general it makes it so that at high levels, enemies are much less tedious to deal with in New Vegas. Now you can die faster too, but we'll take a battle that can end quickly over one that takes forever and a day. Another interesting addition is Hardcore Mode, which introduced a ton of survival elements into the gameplay that make it a lot tougher. Stim packs no longer heal instantly, crippled limbs can only be healed through certain methods, ammunition actually has weight, companions can die, your character actually has to eat, drink, and sleep, or they suffer from negative effects. For players looking for a challenge, it's a new way to play the game and adds a lot of interesting complications. We're mostly here for the story, so it's not something I I've personally spent a lot of time with, but it's a cool feature anyway. There are other minor things that add up to make the game a lot more interesting as well, like the greater number of guns. Like in Fallout 3, it's pretty easy to get tons of ammo because there were only a couple of ammo types, but in New Vegas, it can actually get a bit difficult finding the right ammo just because there are so many different guns that require different ammo that it makes it so you might actually run out of ammo sometimes, which helps uh, sell the fact the game takes place in a, you know, post apocalyptic wasteland. Along with all that, there's a pretty robust weapon modding system that's nothing compared to Fallout 4, but was pretty cool, as well as various forms of gambling, including a Gwent-like game called Caravan. So while the gameplay improvements were mostly minor, altogether they add a lot to the experience. Another thing that's unique about the game is the world itself. Instead of throwing you into a big open world and letting you go whatever direction you want, the game follows a little more linear path, you know, if you're sticking to the story. Instead of being a big play box, the world is shaped more like a racetrack. There are some mountains in the middle, you start off at the bottom left, eventually you make your way up north where New Vegas is, and normally, the game wants you to take the long way around instead of just heading north from Good Springs, and the encounters are more manageable if you do that, but if you straight up just decide to take the road, the I-15, you'll find the pass overrun with death claws, some of the more dangerous creatures in the Fallout universe. And unless you're really good at sneaking or just really lucky, they'll kill you in seconds and you'll be forced to take the intended route to the east. Now, the fact that you can sneak by these guys is awesome, though. The game wants you to go in a certain direction, but if you really want, you can go a completely different direction.
direction. I think that's what really makes New Vegas different from a lot of the other games that came out in that time period especially. Instead of putting a hard stop on the player and saying no, it just does things to encourage players to follow the path they want you to go on, but you can still do something different. Certain choices or styles of gameplay are definitely less effective than others, but the game lets you build a character how you want to, and because there's some resistance, it makes your choices actually feel important. That's actually the problem with a lot of open world games where they make everything just a little too player friendly. Like in most games, they make it so you can't screw yourself by killing an NPC that's important. They just do it by making it so NPCs can't be killed. But in New Vegas, they just say screw it. Like you can kill an incredibly important NPC, a leader of one of the main factions, by mistake right at the start of the game. That's what's so great about it. It gives you the tools to make the story of the game feel like you your story. In Fallout 3, you're chasing after your dad and then fighting the Enclave because the game tells you to. In Fallout 4, you're looking for your son, and that's pretty much it. But in Fallout New Vegas, if you don't want to get revenge on that dude who killed you, you don't have to. Seriously, for certain routes, you don't ever have to see him again if you don't want to. The amount of options are just mind-boggling, so much so that it's hard to imagine how Obsidian managed to get all those moving parts working at all in 18 months. And okay, yes, it's pretty clear they struggled with it because there are a ton of bugs regarding quest triggers and story bits like even now but it's all because they were a little too ambitious with their ideas and it's hard to fault somebody for that and even after all this it still feels like we're just scratching the surface there's not enough time to get into everything like mr new vegas the weird wasteland perk that adds a bunch of goofy fallout 2 style easter eggs into the game the ambitious but divisive dlcs like we could talk about this game for hours if we really wanted to but let's stop the Things here and just say there's a lot about New Vegas that's completely awesome. The level of player choice in everything you do makes the game feel almost infinitely replayable. The world's fascinating, the various characters are interesting, and the quest design is a huge step over what they were doing in Fallout 3, and probably, honestly, everything in Fallout 4 too. For us, what really made this game great was how it managed to really capture the spirit of those original Fallout games. It's scrappy, it's rough around the edges, but the whole thing is bursting with ambition. Not all of its ideas worked out perfectly, especially running on Fallout 3's already pretty creaky engine, but it managed to do something few games are capable of doing. It created a world where your choices really felt like they mattered, and the decisions you made would have a tangible effect on the future of its universe. It's something that many have promised, but very few games have really managed to pull off, even now. Fallout New Vegas is a great game that, even after years of bug fixes, still has its fair share of problems, but all in all, remains is one of the best open world RPGs ever made. And with Bethesda and Obsidian now under the same Microsoft banner, we can actually feasibly hope someday that we might see a new Vegas 2, or at least some kind of spiritual successor, or maybe even just cooperation on the next Fallout game so that quest design is on this level. Few games have had an afterlife like Fallout New Vegas. Originally disregarded as being overpriced DLC at best, it's now considered by many to be the the best game in the entire Fallout series. And while its stock has only gone up in the years that have passed, we still feel like it's an underrated game in a lot of ways. If you haven't given it much time because the gunplay isn't as polished as Fallout 4, and it's generally kind of ugly in comparison to any modern game, it's still worth a second look. It's a game that takes some time to really get the player invested, and even though the opening hours are pretty slow, you get far enough and you'll eventually see why we like it so much. It's just an incredible game. Even now, over 10 years later, it's so good that it makes me wish for nuclear winter, you know, so I can stay inside and play it. I, I had to wedge that line in somewhere. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. The best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable all notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. We'll See you next time right here on Game Ranks.